thank you very much for the invitation. Um, that's who I am. Uh, I used to work in London for the last two and a half years. I've relocated myself uh, in Kuwait to support the local team. Uh, that's the only disclosure I have. Uh, I'm not a huge sleeve fan. My default mode is uh, run Y gastric bypass. Uh, I use the indications to do a sleeve, as the previous speakers said, when I shouldn't do a sleeve, then I will do, uh, when I shouldn't do a bypass, then I will do a sleeve. The reason why is if I get a leak from a bypass, four to six weeks is going to heal. If I get a leak from a sleeve, we're for a very long ride. Uh, how common is the leak? We quote around 1%. I think uh, the leak rate practically is maybe below 0.5%. Um, we're seeing less and less leaks. Uh, the reason why is that uh, we'll be, we're getting a little bit better, but also we have a little bit better equipment than we had 15 years ago when we started doing the sleeves and the initial guns, at least at uh, the ETS and the flex when I started, was fairly primitive. And then uh, Covidian came with the tri technology, and then we got uh, uh, Echelon technology. So better staple line technology, better understanding of uh, gastric stapling. We used to fire very quickly, apply the stapler, press the button, now wait a little bit, let the tissue edema dissipate. We get a better, uh, more hemostatic staple line. Um, maybe less aggressive dissection going too close towards the esophagus to try to, see, to achieve a very uh, tight sleeve. There were long arguments around 2010, 28, 30, 32, 34, Bouzy. Uh, most people now will be rather generous on the Bouzy side. Uh, and also you have better technology when you deal with the uh, vessel sealing. Um, the modern sealing equipment is very fast, very reliable. And also the surgeons doing more and more. They're getting better and better. That's, that's undeniable. Uh, where do the leaks occur? Usually leaks from a sleeve, they will occur in the angle of his or the new angle of sorrow. But practically can occur anywhere. Uh, the ones that are really bothersome are the ones in the uh, staple, uh, in the, the angle of his area. Uh, predisposing factors, there are many factors that can cause uh, a leak. Ischemia, stapling too close towards the esophagus, going very tight on the bousy in the area there, ending up with a distal stenosis in, in the incisura, increasing the intragastric pressure of the sleeve can lead to uh, staple line failure. Poor stapling technique, uh, that's another factor, sometimes operator dependent, and poor choice of staple height, very thick stomach, not the right size uh, of uh, cartridge, and the line can be disrupted and give in. What hasn't changed at all is how does the leak manifest? It manifests as it used to manifest 15 years ago. Coming here, I had to do a lot of adjustments because lots of things were quite different from what I was used to. So I'm going to talk how we manage the leaks. Uh, the last year since we fully recovered from COVID, we have treated three leaks, two from, two from minis, one from Mary Sleeve. Uh, both, two of them came because they needed ECMO and Jabber provides ECMO. Uh, two of them had a successful outcome, one didn't have a successful outcome, succumbed very quickly since arrival. Uh, so how do I treat a leak? The first of all is to suspect if something is not right with the patient, the first thing you, th you think is a leak. It's a leak until proven otherwise. So investigate immediately, act within the golden hour. Usually this is the first six hours. If you leave a lot of time to pass by, uh, then you start getting into full inflammatory response. And uh, bariatric patients, notoriously, they don't have a lot of physiological reserves to withstand long-standing sepsis. So uh, whatever you can get, upper GIs with water-soluble contrast, difficult to get them round the clock. So the, here, the practically, the most realistic test you can get is a, a CT with oral contrast. 
uh, they're not going to do two liters. They're not going to drink two liters. So a couple of hundred is more than enough to see if there's any extravasation. Sepsis control, get them quickly to theater, wash out, get off, rid of all the pus, whatever is there in the area of the leak, clots, uh, leave a drain in, that's as much as you can do, and uh, get the patient back. Usually they end up on ITU. Um, think early for alimentation. If you can provide an enteral access with a feeding jets, I prefer it. I used to do that in London. I had a nice kit which was easy to insert. Unfortunately, here I don't get it. I can't find it. I don't know why. Uh, I don't like using uh, folic catheters. So I rely on TPN to support the patient for the first few weeks until I reach the point. The next point is to have a, at least a stable patient and think about I need to seal the leak. And then I speak to the interventional gastroenterologist. I'm very privileged. I have a very good colleague of mine who has the sur a surgeon's thinking, but he's a gastroenterologist. He always thinks ahead. So whatever you, you do, stand, clips, they don't work really. Spawns, pigtails, I don't have experience. I haven't tried. My experience with leaks has always been with stents, and I feel comfortable. Uh, using them because they have always, for me at least, uh, give consistent results. What is crucial is the next point, patients. Unfortunately, Middle, Middle Eastern patients are very impatient. They can't take a long hospitalization. And they're gonna give you really a hard time and they're gonna drive you to your knees emotionally and you have to bear with it because they go in for an operation, they feel they're gonna be out in one day and all of a sudden they're weeks and weeks and weeks, lots of interventions, and then they're getting really frustrated. And you get a lot of relatives and a lot of calls coming from all over the country. What is important is always have a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, gather as much support as you can. Uh, you need your nutritionist. Uh, you need the psychologist to support them. Microbiologist to provide you advice for any changing uh, cultures and need for antibiotics in septic patients and also you need a very uh, aggressive radiologist, interventional radiologist for training any, any collections. And uh, hopefully with all this in the fullness of time with a stent, usually the leak will heal in four out of five times. Uh, <coughs> stents <laughs> It's not my remit. Uh, you can use, usually we use the expandable stents, metal or uh, plastic, fully covered or partially covered. Uh, I have seen interventional gastroenterologists using both. Um, the problem I have is that they are not available. You don't walk into a cupboard and all of a sudden you find 50 stents staring at you, different sizes, different lengths, different diameters, that's not the case. Usually you've got two, three of them and you have to improvise. And uh, sometimes they're not the exact right stent, but you have to use something because there's nothing else available. Um, I think the partially covered stents have uh, uh, better tissue and growth and hopefully they hold the stent though they can to migrate as well, and they need to be removed or repositioned. If you use the, self, uh, the partially covered stand, you need to have a plan to replace them. Uh, maybe every three to four weeks, if you leave them longer, they're really difficult to get them out because of the tissue and growth, and you have to put a plastic stand inside the uh, partially covered stand to allow the tissue growth to uh, regress before you can remove it. Uh, so as I said, for me, it's the most reliable way of treating a leak uh, because I know a four out of five of times I'll get a successful leak uh, healing. And in one out of five, I will get a chronic fistula which uh, on a stable person, you have a lot of options to go for. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the mechanical issues, how to treat them. And these are classified under an umbrella. 
it is a stenosis or a kink or a stricture or a rotation, whatever it is, it just delays or obstructs significantly the normal flow of the uh, gastric contents, raises the uh, intragastric pressure. And if it is a technical error that occurs early, which is when you go too close to the incisura, they can also uh, encourage a leak. Causes of the stricture, apart from the early ones, which are the ones that they occur due to a technical fa failure, and they will manifest relatively early, the first week or so, that the patient will not be able to progress into uh, a diet plan. You get the chronic ones that they will manifest later, a few weeks or a few months, and this usually are due to ischemia uh, retraction or scarring of the uh, of the sleeve. Uh, people here tend to use a lot of reinforced staple line, and my experience, the, the most common operation I do now is converting a sleeve to a bypass and repair the hiatus hernia. I see a lot of scarring between the left lobe of the liver. Many of these patients didn't have a proper liver stinking diet, so had they had the operation with a large sizable left lobe of the liver, when the sleeve finishes and the liver falls on the sleeve, it tends to stick on the staple line and the reinforcement line. How to avoid uh, strictures? Uh, have a safe distance between incisure and the staple line. Uh, when you oversaw, always have a bougie inside to make sure that you don't uh, stricture the lumen. Uh, important, keep the staple line straight and uh, make sure you have a symmetrical rotation. Rotating the gun can give you less resection anteriorly, more resection posteriorly, and you end up with a sleeve that looks rotated. One of the things I always do is, every time I fire the staple, I remove the clip from the, from the corner. There's always a loose clip there, and if you don't do that and keep on staple, stapling in, in, in a straight line, you're going to find three, four clips tracking across and giving you a very bad uh, staple line. Uh, how do they manifest? Uh, usually it's difficulty in eating, nausea, vomiting. Uh, they can progress to the diet schedule. Um, occasionally, they can even have their own saliva down if they're uh, that, that bad. Uh, and usually, they complain a lot of uh, uh, reflux symptoms, which is either volume reflux or, or, or heartburn. Clinically, you can suspect that something is wrong by just taking a history. It's obvious something is not quite right. Uh, they haven't been able to tolerate liquids that are dehydrated. An intraoperative gastroscopy uh, will give you a visual of what's going on. We always, I call it a surgical endoscopy. You don't need the gastroenterologist doing that. They're not going to give you what you want to do. You want to have a look with your own eyes to assess if there is a rotation or a kinking or anything else the scope may go through, but that, means, that doesn't mean that necessarily uh, things flow through. Also, an upper GI is very important. It gives you a good roadmap at the level of the uh, problem. And always you can get confused, oh, is it the normal post-op if it is early enough? Is it the normal post-operating nausea and vomiting because of the stomach stunning syndrome? Uh, but nevertheless, it's better to uh, investigate and an upper GI is a very uh, easy test to do. So we start all with conservative treatment, kneel by mouth, hydrate, uh, make sure that they don't aspirate, wait for the symptoms to improve, give them some IV PPI to reduce a little bit of a gastric edema and gastric secretions, try and establish a feeding access. People here don't like tubes through the nose. Uh, they really hate them. It's very difficult to convince, the, to convince someone to have an NJ tube in. Uh, TPN is another option, and uh, very important is to maintain nutrition. If there is something that looks like a short stenosis, and uh, you're talking about a chronic problem, you may try and do a balloon dilatation or a stent. 
to my experience, both of them are a waste of time. They will last a few days and then they will come back again with the same problem. Um, early enough, someone needs to be careful on an early staple line. The first, definitely nothing the first two weeks. I personally uh, feel much more comfortable manipulating a staple line four weeks and over. Uh, between two and four weeks, I'm always a little bit wary of causing myself a perforation. And always remember thiamine. We're still seeing cases of thiamine deficiency, which is sad. People have had a sleep, they've gone to home, they keep on vomiting two weeks, they come in and they have symptoms of thiamine deficiency. So always replace thiamine. Don't give dextrose before you give thiamine, just give only uh, normal saline, because if you give dextrose and they have thiamine deficiency, you're gonna make it worse. Um, <clears throat> surgical treatment, if there is early and you had a CT and there is a hematoma, you can suspect that maybe a compression, you go and uh, you aspirate the hematoma. If you put a, a, an oversewing line, you might think of removing your oversewing stitches. I personally don't oversew, I trust my staplers. Um, if there is any obvious kinking, you may attempt to uh, reduce the kink by fixing the sleeve. Um, the safest option really practically when you deal with a problem that doesn't settle is to convert them to a and Y and uh, that gives you less, less uh, headache. Endoscopic treatments, trixuroplasties, uh, and seromyotomies, I don't have much of experience but uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure how effective they are. Um, my default is to convert them to the bypass. And uh, what is important is to uh, be aware that some cases may need to be converted to a total gastrectomy and esophagogeginostomy because the problem is very high. There's a bad technical error. You have a very short pouch and uh, there's nothing much about you can do than doing an esophagogeginostomy. So my algorithm is if they are clinical symptoms of mechanical obstructions, stricture, I'll do an upper GI and an EGD, try conservative first. If there's no improvement, maybe try dilatation just to give a little bit more time and see if they will respond. Uh, stents, as I said, I'm not a huge fan. Um, usually the problem if they don't respond, is taken back to theater, see exactly what is the problem during your laparoscopy and uh, convert them to a gastric bypass. Reflux, I don't consider reflux a, a complication. The reason why is it's, it's, if you think about the normal anatomy, you have the esophagus with a pump, muscular pump, then you have the uh, esophagogastic junction, the lower esophageal sphincter, which is a, a valve. And then you have the stomach, which is again another pump. And then you have the pylorus, which is another valve. And all of a sudden, you're going to remove 70, 80% of the function of one of the pumps. So the system initially is going to work, but gradually it will start failing. And uh, I see more and more people uh, uh, with reflux, and usually, I tend to see them around 10 years after the gastric bypass. This is the, the mark that they come with reflux that they can manage it conservatively on PPIs. There was a recent paper which shows up to 30% de novo uh, reflux within 10 years, and I do believe that for me it's a, it's a true number. Um, conversion to a RUNY bypass, I believe is around the area of the 20%, either for weight again or for uh, mixed with, uh, with reflex. Barrett's esophagus, that's another point which is still really we don't know a lot. Uh, the recent paper I showed you, they show, it showed an incidence of 0.5%, which is very low, about 0.1% is in the general population. Some other papers have reported up to 10, 15% Barrett's, so it is how, up, how aggressively you seek Barrett's, what you define Barrett's, columnar versus columnar with the intestinal metaplasia, there are two de different definitions of Barrett's in different parts of the world. Um, but this is something that 
obviously needs address in the long term when more data is available. How do I work up people with the GERD and a sleeve? I look at their symptoms and how they have responded to the BPIs. Uh, take a weight loss history, see if there's any, what was their lowest weight, have they put weight on, how much? I do always a surgical endoscopy myself. I want to have a roadmap. I want to look for rotations, stenosis. I want to know if there is esophagitis, if there's a hiatus hernia, how big that hernia is, if there is barrels and biopsy and get the result if it is just simple metaplasia. More importantly, I want to measure the, if there's any obstruction, how far is this obstruction from my OGJ because this is will determine to me if I can do a safe uh, bypass. Uh, an upper GI endoscopy, I always do it routinely because it shows me how the esophagus is, provides information about the esophageal motility. Sometimes you see a little bit of a struggling esophagus which is a bit dilated with uh, tertiary contractions. You get a better understanding of the size of the hiatus hernia. On a, on, a, on, a, on a good sleeve, you can't really do a J maneuver easily. You can't reproflex to assess the, the hiatus. So I think a, a barium swallow is a more robust test. Um, and also it gives you good information about the anatomy of the sleeve, the level of the stricture, the length of the stricture, and it just gives you significant information to plan your bypass. Um, if I have a normal sleeve and the endoscopy is normal, there is no esophagitis, there is no response at all to PPIs. The main symptoms tend to be usually heartburn, not a lot of volume reflux. These are the ones I'm not quite sure have they got reflux or not. If I see grade B, C esophagitis, then I know they've got reflux. But these are the ones that I will investigate further with a 24 pH and a manometry, try and get a little bit more information and get objective evidence if there is a reflux and also what type of reflux. Is it acidic? Is it non-acidic? I tend to persevere a lot with the conservative management. Uh, if I get people who have a well-controlled reflux, they do respond to PPI. Main symptom is heartburn. There's not, they're not as much as volume reflexes. The ones that I, I, I tend to be more aggressive surgically is the volume reflexes, the ones that they eat and they go to bed and they lie flat and they say everything comes up. They start getting problems with their lungs. They get repeated chest infections, asthma attacks. These are the ones that tend to be more aggressive in, in operating earlier. The ones that they're just heartburn and they're reasonably managed, I will leave them on a PPI, uh, provide some lifestyle uh, modification advice and make sure they, they, they adhere with it and tell them exactly what to avoid. Also refer them from some weight loss or a nutritionist and uh, now we're quite fortunate to have more effective drugs that they produce, you know, I must admit impressive weight loss in people who had weight to gain. So I think this will be the way forward to deal with the weight to gain. And I also see them regularly uh, run an open access clinic. I say, listen, whenever your symptoms worsen, then please come back and we can always uh, rediscuss the case. So uh, the best option is always convert in people who have reflux for me is to convert them to run Y gastric bypass. If there is a high hernia, I repair it. I always try to do a posterior repair. Uh, Resleeve, really, I, if there is reasonable weight loss, if there's no excessive, ex excessive weight regain, I tend not to resleeve. Uh, but if you decide to resleeve, then you run a higher risk of of a leak rate. I always say to them, I'm not going to make your reflex go away. I'm going to make it better, but I'm not going to make it perfect. I'm sorry. All I can do is give you a little bit of better quality of life. You may have to continue taking PPIs long term, maybe at a lesser dose. We try and see if we can come off them at some time, maybe three to six months after surgery. But I don't tell them I'm going to fix your problem 100% because that will give them unrealistic expectations. When I do the bypass, I always regularly supplement fully my patients. There are lots of patients here that they don't really take supplements and we see more and more problems with deficiencies which are rather late and persistent. Uh, make sure that they, and that's critical, to avoid weight regain. This is 
where the nutrition is also the potential pharmacotherapy is, is critical to pick them up where they start gaining weight and hit them hard. So you try and keep their weight stable. If they put weight on and they come after a year and they have taken, put on 15 kilos, then the reflex is gonna get worse. Uh, <coughs> I'm always, I'm not quite sure about what is the role of the one anastomosis gastric bypass. My friend Messari is here and he's got a great experience with them. In the treatment of GERD disease after a sleeve, when you have a normal sleeve and a weight regain, you don't have a big hiatus hernia, and uh, obviously a mini will give them a better weight regain, uh, but I always take the route of the safer option and I go for the RU and Y, but there may be a role for the mini, I'm not quite sure, time will tell. Masari has an interest in this. Interesting, an interest in this, and we'll see who is behaving better. One minute left. So that's all. Thank you very much indeed. If any questions, I'd be happy to take.